All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we last couple of weeks we tied up our initial studies talking about some of the preliminary um, topics that we were looking at. What is the Bible? How to study the Bible? Um, and so then tonight, what I want to do is we're going to start a little short series to kind of bridge us through the rest of August. Because um, I want to kind of get us aligned with the rest of the stuff. Um, and typically we have studies and stuff that start, home groups will start again, the lady study will start again. Typically that stuff begins again at the end of August or the beginning of September, right around the start of the school year. So I want to kind of get us aligned with that a little bit. Um, so we'll do this short series for the next three or four weeks to get us through the end of August um, to align us with, with the rest of the start of the rest of everything else. And what this series is called is, what does the Bible say about? And I'm going to kind of leave it open-ended for us, to, you guys, to throw in questions. And if you're in our YouTube audience, you can email questions to me or WhatsApp them to me, Facebook Messenger. Um, and we'll deal with as many questions as we can. I think we've got four weeks if we look at doing this through the end of August. One, two, three, four. We'll do this for five weeks. That'll take us into the first full week in September. Um, so we'll, we'll be able to cover five questions in this format. And then if I get more questions than that, I'll do like a little a little video blog um, to cover the rest of them. So we'll do this for the next several weeks. And so some examples, what are, what are you know, some examples that you can think of, questions you might have, theological questions or practical questions or, um, you know, I think of things like, what does the Bible say about evolution? Are those two things compatible? What does the Bible say about spiritual gifts? Or what do we understand about those? And what do they look like and how they function? What does the Bible say about eternal security? Um, or, you know, any other questions that you can come up with. Um, so tonight, we're starting with one that Amanda sent me. Amanda Serta sent me last week. Um, what does the Bible say? I'm going to read her. Make sure I get the question right, because if we don't get the question right, then we get the answer wrong, right? What does the Bible say about how to represent Christ in the workplace? How to be a Christian at work? That's where we'll start this week. Um, Jeff, I know you are new to the Tuesday night, joining into the Zoom study. Um, I do want this to be more of a dialogue than a monologue. So feel free to stop me and ask questions. If, um, if you have them, feel free to stop me and make comments uh, as we go along. Uh, that way we, this doesn't become just, a, just me talking, but it becomes a true interaction over the Word of God. So before I open up our time in prayer and we start to dig into answering this question, I want to talk a little bit about the way forward. So... I mentioned last week that I goofed up on the schedule and we're doing this Tuesday night and Kate asked me about the ladies Bible study that's going to start back up in September and she asked you know about Tuesday night is that okay and then going on with the church I didn't connect the dots I was thinking about anything physically at the church and so I goofed up, and so she's already scheduled out the ladies' Bible study on Tuesdays. So we'll do this on Tuesday night for the next two weeks. This week, the 18th will be on Tuesday night, and then that following week, the week of the 24th, we will switch to Monday nights. Um, so it'll be Monday at 5.30 instead of Tuesday at 5.30. Um, I did get a request for it to move to Wednesday instead of instead of Monday, but I, I have something, a regular appointment Wednesday evening, so that won't work for me. So starting on the 24th, we'll switch it to Monday evening. Um, and then 
the question I want to throw out for you to think about, for you to consider, as everything opens back up in the fall, I want you to tell me whether you want to continue to do this or not. Um, I'm not trying to get out of it. That's, that's not where I'm going with it. Um, I love to teach the word of God, and I will absolutely be in to do this for as long as you guys want to be a part of it. Um, but I'm a little bit concerned when the schedule starts to pick back up in the fall. We'll have the ladies' study on Tuesday nights, men's study every other Thursday. Home groups will start back up. And what I don't want is folks to feel obligated to come to this. Oh, yeah, I told Pastor I was going to go, so we got to be there. Oh, there's one more thing on the calendar. Um, if it's something you want to continue and you don't feel it's too much, we'll continue to do this after we're done with this short little series. If, it's, if you feel like, you know what, I'm going to be in a home group, I'm going to be in the men's study, and my you know, the wife's going to be in the, in the women's study, and you know, it's just going to be too many things happening. And if you, if you think that's the case, I want you to just tell me, just be honest about it. Um, and then we would not continue this into the fall. So if you know one way or the other tonight, right now, tell me now. Um, if you want to think about it, look at the schedule, see what's going to go on, decide for you and your family what you're going to do when the fall kicks back off again, um, and then tell me later, that's okay too. So I just want to kind of put that out there um, as an option for where we're going when we're finished with this study. Any questions so far? No, sir. Okay. Sir, is y'all good? I'll get here. Okay. Um, if if we do decide to continue into the fall, we we will do a book of the Bible study when we're finished with this short little "What does the Bible say about" series. Um, a couple people have mentioned the book of the Revelation as a place to go, and <clears throat> I'm good with that. Completely good with that. I think that would be a challenging book for us to dig into. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> and I, and I would love the challenge of being able to open it up and teach it week after week. Um, my only concern about doing the revelation is that if we, it's 22 chapters long. So if we just did one chapter a week, we're going to be over the holidays and there'll be some, some weeks here and there that we probably won't be able to meet. It's six months if we just do one chapter a week. And, but that's really given us a 30,000 foot look. I, I get the sense that you're in this study because you want to peel the onion back a little bit more. Um, you don't want a 30,000 foot look. You want to get down up close and personal into those, into those passages. And for us to do that in the Revelation, it's going to take us a year and some change for us to be able to really pick that book apart uh, and go through it that way. So what I'm going to recommend instead is that in September, when we finish this study, we move into a book of the Bible, that we will do here on Monday nights the same book that I'm preaching on on Sunday. And that'll be 1 Thessalonians. That's what I'm going to start preaching on in September. We're going to preach all the way through 1 Thessalonians. Um, and the reason I, I think maybe that might be a good place for us to start digging into a book of the Bible is if, if you've ever taught, you know, a Bible study, taught a passage of Scripture, you've come across the fact that there is way more there than you can ever cover in a lesson. And so on Sunday morning, we cover as much as we can in the time there, but there's a whole lot more that's left unsaid about all those passages that we covered Sunday morning. And then, so if we're doing the same passages here on Monday nights, that gives us an opportunity. Hey, you had a question on Sunday that came up, and we have a chance to address that. We have a chance to dig a little deeper here on Monday night than we do on Sunday morning. Um, so 
that would be my recommendation for where we go when we finish this. Thoughts or comments or other ideas? I'm good with whatever, um, you know, is easiest for you, Pastor. I know what it's like to do these things. Um, obviously, me, I'm just trying to support you in your endeavors and also grow in God's grace uh, as we go. So, um, you know, I, you, you're a busy man. I don't want to tax you because I know Bible um, interpretation is, is hard work as well. So, and it's time consuming. But, um, yeah, you know, if we want to, I'm good with whatever the flavor of the month is, honestly. Uh, I'm just looking to grow any way that the spirit leads. So. Okay, thank you. Sir, is any input? No, we're, we're kind of just, uh, we're just tracking along the same. Um, no no major issues no i mean yeah it sounds like a, a a good plan and then as far as like in the future um sonia was here she made kind of a good comment <clears throat> to kind of treat this more along the line of a adult vbs <laughs> uh concept and just have it during the summer uh type and uh, and then go from there and then when we were <clears throat> talking about questions we were really starting to think of some possibilities that we might throw out there for the coming weeks okay um yeah and just shoot those to me when we get done um either text them to me or email them to me um and yeah i'll kind of put that out there for the youtube audience as well to say if we you know give me your comments on whether you want to continue this into the fall or not because the schedule will get considerably more busy in the fall with the home groups kicking back off and the lady studies and stuff so let me know what you think about that. If we do continue, we'll just plan to do First Thessalonians. And, and Jeff, I appreciate your comment. It's, I, I am absolutely willing and excited to do the work and dig in um, and spend the time to interpret a, a different book of the Bible. But I think there's some benefit, too, in us being able to Monday evening, let's unpack a little further what we talked about on Sunday. And, and so that and also drive some questions, too. As you sit there on Sunday morning, you see something in the text that I don't cover. And, and now I know that happens every week because I just don't have time to. Um, and you'll say, you know, I really want you, you didn't mention this one phrase and how that fits and what that means. And I, man, I really want you to do that. So let me know what you think about continuing. And then we will, if we do continue, we'll do First Thessalonians. Now I'm calling that sermon series um, countercultural because that really is the, the theme and the, and the, the central drive of First Thessalonians, he's driving the church in Thessalonica to live counterculture, live for Christ in the midst of this world. And so um, I think that'll be a good study for us. Okay, so tonight we do have a lot of ground to cover. So we're going to jump in answering this question that Amanda gave us, how to represent Christ well at work. And, you know, sometimes, and, and maybe this is too often, there is a gap in our lives between Sunday and Monday. And we sit in church on Sunday and we have our Bible open and we think about praising the Lord and we think about discipleship and, and, and it seems so cut and dried. And it seems and when I, you know, we're all excited and, and fired up about following after Christ. And then you know, we get to work on Monday and there is sometimes a very big difference in our lives. Not that we're, you know, we're running wild at work, but there's a difference in that attitude and that commitment and that drive to be disciples on Monday when I'm sitting at my desk and I'm drudging through emails than there is on Sunday. And you think, how do these two things fit together? And realizing that in, in God's economy, we don't have a Sunday morning us and a Monday morning us. There's no gap. And in fact, the, for Jesus's ministry, when he was walking this earth, the vast majority of the places he taught, the times he taught, was out in the community, out in the marketplace. The minority of times was in the synagogue. And so I think there's something very telling about that to say, 
this gospel was intended for us to be living it out, taking it out into the workplace. And so I think this is a great question, Amanda. I'm glad you asked it. How do we do that? What does that look like? And I want to base our time tonight on a book. Um, and I'll show you the I'll show you the book. Great title: How to Be a Christian at Work. Isn't that a wonderful title for a book? And uh, this ministry that wrote this book is called God and Work, um, and they do workshops and stuff based on that very same topic. But um, they, I, I want to use their initial thoughts as kind of a, a framework for us to talk about tonight. What does it mean uh, to represent Christ at work? How do we do that? How do we be a Christian in the workplace? And so we're going to look at a bunch of scriptures tonight, and I'm going to kind of put them out there now. And I want you to kind of volunteer to read them, and that'll save us some time as we move along. <clears throat> um, and you remember them, though, because I'm not going to write this down. And so if I don't write it down, then this conversation didn't happen. Um, so you remember which ones you're going you're gonna to be reading. Um, and then when we come to them, I'll just call for them, and then you, you bust it out. Um, 1 Corinthians 5, 6. Somebody volunteer to take that. You'll have to unmute yourself because I can't hear you when you volunteer. <clears throat> First Corinthians 5, 6. Who wants to take that one? Give me a second. I'm I'm half half getting home and half listening. Okay. You don't have to look it up right now. You Just to know that right when now. it comes up, that would be yours. When it comes up, that would be yours. We, we can get it. Okay. Um, Galatians, um, Galatians 3, 24. 3, 24. How many, how many are you going to list? Oh, a truckload of them. Oh, a truckload of them. Okay. <laughs> so we can get ready because uh, Sonia's looking for that one. Okay. I mean, you don't need them right now. Yeah, when they come up. Right and, 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 and you'll probably want to, you know, volunteer to take them individually take rather them than the, rather than the, the group. The Serta family will take this one. Um, so where were Galatians 6, 9. And Acts 5.41. Oh, you know what I'm going to do? I just thought about this. I can send a chat to everybody, and I will just list them. How's that? And then you can see them. This is not our first day, right? Yeah. It seems like it is, though, doesn't it? First time we've ever used Zoom, and we're just now figuring it out. But this will get them all out there, and then they're sitting in front of us, so you don't have to try to remember them all. And I bet when you asked this question, you had no idea there'd be this much. The Word of God has to say that's applicable to our work center. All right, so that'll get us started with the with the scriptures that we'll need to look up. Um, and so I'll just kind of call them out. We may have people arm wrestling over them, but that's okay. I want to start our time, though, in Daniel chapter 1. So that'll kind of be our, our focus text as we consider this question, how to be a Christian at work. I'm going to ask you to turn there, Daniel chapter 1. Jeff, if you're driving, don't try to do that while you're driving. Um, so let me say a word of prayer, and then we will jump into Daniel and look at what the Word of God has to say to us about how to live out Christ in the workplace. So pray with me. 
Father, we thank you that we have the chance tonight to uh, once again open your word, be instructed by it. Lord, we are reminded that so much of your ministry here on this earth was done out on the street, out in the marketplace, out and about in the community. And that's instructive and telling for us that you want us to do the same. And so, Father, as we find ourselves in workplaces and find ourselves asking these questions on a regular basis, how am I to be a believer here? How am I to impact this area for Christ? Lord, I pray you would speak to us tonight. As you do, as you teach, as you lead and guide, uh, Father, help us to hear and to understand what you have to say to us. And Father, would you just bless this time we have together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so Daniel chapter 1, um, I'm going to read verses 8 through 14, and then we'll start talking about um, what this, there's an there's a acronym this book gives us to help us think about how to live out Christ in the workplace. So follow along, Daniel chapter 1, verses 8 through 14. But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander and the officials. And the commander of the officials said to Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord the king, who has appointed your food and your drink, for why should he see your faces looking more haggard than the youths who are your own age? Then you would make, then you would make me forfeit my head for the king. But Daniel said to the overseer, whom the commander of the officials had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, to please test your servants for ten days, and let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. And then let our appearance be observed in the presence and, and the appearance of the youths who are eating the king's choice food, and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter, and he, and he tested them for ten days. Okay, so here's the background of what's going on here. Um, starting the, up at the beginning of Daniel chapter 1, verse 1, um, we're, we're given the indication this has happened that Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, has been taken exile into Babylon. They fall into Babylon. Um, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, has started sort of an indoctrination program, if you will. Um, for the leading youths of Judah. And he's brought them in. He's going to teach them the ways of the Babylonians, the education, um, the, the culture, the literature, the language. Uh, he's really trying to indoctrinate them into, their, into the Babylonian culture. And at the same time, he's introducing them to the finer things in life of what it means to be Babylonian, the food and the choice wine that the king himself consume. Now, among that group, there are four Hebrew boys that particularly stand out, and they're named there in verse 6. We just mentioned them a moment ago, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And, and down in verse 7, the commander of the uh, officials gives them new names, and Three of those names are very familiar to you. He renames Daniel Belteshazzar. And then he renames the other three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And those are very familiar names, those last three in particular. Those, those four boys are among this group of leading youths that have been brought in um, to be a part of the Babylonian indoctrination. And here's the problem that they face. How can we be faithful among the pressure that we're facing to give in and to follow along with these cultures and these customs, some of which clash with the word of God and clash with what we know to be true? And so this is a, a very relevant passage for us in answering this question, how is it that I can live out my, my faith in the workplace? because this is essentially the issue they face. Um, I read a um, sort of a business equivalent 
of the situation that these boys face themselves in. And this is the way it works. Because if this, if this is what, if these guys were in the corporate world instead of in Babylon, this is what the situation would look like. It's that he and his friends are new recruits to a management training program. They're getting pressure to conform to company policy and practices that at times clashes with their faith. And they have to decide what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. And so that really is the question that, that lays before us. How do we do that? And this book rec recommends an acronym for us to help, to help guide us in making those decisions and thinking about um, living my faith at my desk when I'm doing emails. And that acronym is NICER. We asked you just to write that down. N-I-C-E-R. That's the acronym. We're going to kind of use that as the basis of our, our time and our study tonight, um, looking at this passage and looking at these other passages to see how they, how they instruct us on this question. NICER. That's the acronym. Now, being nice is important, right? I mean, everybody likes nice people. Nobody goes around, ah, that guy's so nice, I can't stand him. I'm not going to talk to that guy, he's just way too nice. You know, everybody likes nice people. Being nice is good, being nice is important. Being nice when possible is biblical. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, he said, be kind, tenderhearted to one another. It's a good thing to be nice. It's, it's something that we ought to do, society expects us to do, certainly the Word of God instructs us to do. But this is more than just being nice. Listen, if we're just nice in the workplace, and that's, that's the sum total of our Christian witness. I'm just going to be a nice guy. And, you know, you've heard the saying, preach the gospel at all times and use words if necessary. Um, and I, I prefer to change that a little bit. Preach the gospel at all times and use words they're necessary. Because if, if we're just nice in the workplace, and we just, I'm just going to live by Christian principles, and I'm just going to be a good guy, I'm just going to be a nice guy at work, people may very well come to believe that nice is what's required for heaven. Listen, I know that guy at work is a Christian. And the only thing I've ever seen him do or heard him do is really just be nice around me. He never talked about Jesus. He's never talked about church. He's never talked about the Bible. He's just been a good guy. So I guess then that's what it means to be a Christian. That's what's required. Just be a good guy. Nice is important. but That's not really what this acronym NICER is talking about. It is an acronym, and I'm going to spell it out for you, and then we'll look at each of the principles. N is no compromises. I is integrity. C is compassionate in relationships. E is excellent work. R is responsible to and for others. So NICER, that's the acronym we're going to look at, and we're going to take each of those, look at them one at a time, See what, how Daniel's story applies, and then see what else the Word of God has to say. First of all, N, no compromises. Verse 8 says that Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself. There's something significant about settling that matter in your mind and saying whether I'm at work or I'm at play or I'm on vacation, that's settled in my mind that the way it's worded there that Daniel said he would not defile himself. And, and that word defile in Hebrew, the original word that was used there, it meant to pollute or to stain something. Now, most of, most of us that are on tonight are not the laundry doers in our family, but if you are, um, you know, it doesn't take much of a stain 
right, to ruin a piece of cloth, to ruin a piece of clothing. And if you if you've ever messed around and thrown a red sock in with the white clothes in the washer, it doesn't take a whole lot, right, to ruin that entire load of laundry. It doesn't take a lot of a stain. It doesn't take a lot of pollution to pollute the entire air. It can just a little bit, and it can really pollute the environment that you're in. And that's really what that word meant. Daniel settled it in his mind that he wasn't going to pollute himself. He wasn't going to stain himself. First Corinthians 5, 6, who has that? I can. I'm right here. I can. I'm right here. Go ahead and read that for us, Jeff. All right. Sorry, I just had to pull my Bible up. First Corinthians five six. Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Now we don't usually refer to it as leaven nowadays. Yeast. That's what he's talking about. A little yeast. And if you're a baker and you've put yeast in a lump of dough, um, you understand exactly what he's talking about. It's just a little bit, and man, that spreads all over the place and expands and fills it out, right? Paul's writing that letter to the church in Corinth, and particularly there in chapter 5, and he's dealing with specific sin issues that are going on in their church community, and they're largely turning a blind eye to. And he makes this comment, listen, don't you realize that a little bit of sin is going to spread? It, it doesn't ever stay in a corner. It doesn't ever stay contained. It spreads and it affects everyone. And he's talking about I think he's talking about this idea of compromising, right? Allowing sin in just a little bit. Daniel has made up in his mind. He's settled the matter. It's no longer a question that he's not going to allow even a little bit of stain, a little bit of pollution, not a little bit of compromise. He's not going to allow any. Let me ask you this. Let me get a little dialogue going. What are some ways we talk ourselves into compromise. I know for me personally, know for looking, me personally sideways, looking sideways, looking at other Christians, what's, other acceptable, Christians, to what's acceptable to them. It's kind of a trip. It's kind of a trip. Okay, so kind of looking around okay, so and saying, well, well you know, everybody saying, else is going everybody else is Yeah, kind of like what Jeff was saying, if, if I have someone, like a fellow believer, say, oh, yeah, this is a good thing, then I'm like, oh, well, they're a Christian, and they think it's a good thing, so done, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, you know, allowing yeah, other people to be already on things, on things rather than, let me go back to the Word of God and see if that really is true. Okay, here's the thought. How do we talk about that? doing things to get along in other words accepting it or ignoring it or just you know being um what do you call it if you say something but don't say something you're part of the problem you're part of the problem <laughs> yeah i mean well yeah but like you just kind of like well I'll just, i don't want to cause any trouble so i'll just keep my mouth shut yeah, I yeah. I find most of my compromise comes from keeping my mouth shut because of the uniform um, stuff like trans transgender or just moral issues where you have a strong biblical stance on and um, you know you look at these people in Daniel they obviously were ready to go in the fire in modern day time if you speak out against that um, you know there's the capacity that you're in 
where as a Christian, you may be very opinionated uh, based on the word of God, but it's very difficult to and say something in that context because you can be considered proselytizing or um, offending someone's you know right to act a certain way so it's a really fine line in the uniform yeah you're right jeff it is it is a fine line you have to be cognizant of the fact that um, there are specific restrictions uh, for folks in uniform but at the same time, I think the, the general consensus or the general, you know, we kind of err on the side of caution and say, well, then I won't say anything at all. And, and that's, that's not required either to be in uniform. Um, I know many times when I was active duty, um, I had an opportunity to share Christ with folks. And, and it was started with simple things. I had a Bible sitting on my desk. I had a couple little plaques that had the word of God on them. Um, and they, you know, it was just simple things around the workplace, little com comments here and there, um, that people would open up the conversation. So what do you believe about this? Hey, you know what? At that point, all bets are off. Um, you just asked me, you asked me a question. I was just answering the question. Um, there are ways to do that, but you're right. We have to, we have to be aware um, when you're in uniform, particularly of, of how that looks in the workplace and how you say things. And often we talk ourselves into compromise. And we just talked about some of the ways. My favorite one is this. Well, I have to understand what they're dealing with in order to adequately be able to minister to them. And so I've got to kind of be involved in their sinful world so I can be a, an effective witness to them. And the reality is we often talk ourselves into compromise. And as Paul points out, a little bit of compromise goes a long way. And Daniel settles it in his mind. He said, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna compromise. Now, we're not told specifically what conflicted with Daniel's beliefs. We're told that he was he was offered or ordered to eat the king's choice food, to drink the king's choice wine, but we don't know specifically what the issue was. What about that was offensive? What about that was was uh, something that caused a conflict for Daniel? We do know the Levitical laws were very specific about what they could eat, what they could not eat, how it could be prepared, how it couldn't be. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily important for us to kind of go into what those specifics might have been, because we could spend probably the next 30 minutes speculating about what that was. Um, but the laws, all of them, were given to us for some specific reasons. And I think maybe that's a, an important takeaway for us say, why, why do we have those laws? Why did they have them? Why are there any commandments or laws in scripture? They were given to us for a reason. Galatians 3.24, who's got that one? All righty. Galatians 3.24. The law then was our guardian until Christ so that we could be justified by faith. That word guardian in some translations is translated tutor, uh, teacher. Um, it was, the law was given ultimately to, to bring us to the place of realizing that we couldn't possibly keep the whole thing so that we would realize our need for Christ. But, but also in a very practical way, God gave the law for the same reason that you as parents give rules to your kids. You love them, and you your rules are outlined for them how to stay safe, how to be healthy, how to prosper, how to be successful in life, how to best get along. That, that's, those, that's what your rules do. God's rules were for the same reasons. And when we submit to his commandments, we, we, we're obedient to what he wants us to do. It shows trust. That we trust him. God, I don't really understand all of this. You've got some food laws there maybe in the Old Testament times. I don't get. I'm not sure what to do with that, but I trust you. And so I'll be obedient to it. It shows that we honor him. It shows that we're willingly submitting to his authority. And what we see in Daniel and his friends is they, they made this commitment to not compromise, but they weren't pig-headed about it. They weren't hard-nosed 
about it. Um, they, you know, we, we, can, we read the, the solutions they came up with. They very much were pursuing a win-win here. Listen, I'm not, I'm not trying to get you in trouble, boss, but I've got, some specific, I've got a specific line here that I can't cross. Is there a way that we can, we can pursue a win-win? We can work this out where you can still stand before the king, you can still answer to your boss, but I can still answer to my ultimate boss. And so they, they made a commitment to stand firm, but they weren't hard-nosed about it. They looked for a creative solution. How can, we, how can we pursue a smart way to negotiate with the company's demands? One that allows us both to adhere to what it is that we want to adhere to, we need to adhere to. And they did their part and they left the results up to God. We talked a little bit about that on Sunday, that, that that's where we saw in Stephen. Stephen did his part. He left the results up to God. And ultimately, that's what we, I, I've got to do my, I've got to follow what God has told me to do. Sometimes there'll be consequences for that. And, but I've got to follow this. I've got to not compromise and, and settle that matter in my heart. Okay, so the N is no compromises. Questions about no compromises, comments? Track, you know, it's, yeah, same. Um, one of my favorite um, songs was uh, by Keith Green, and it's, um, you know, he talks about in, um, oh man, <laughs> of course, the title would slip me, but, um, I'll oh, make my life a prayer to you. He mm. talks about that line and it says, you know, I want to share the word um, and spread the love around and live with no compromise, you know, and I, I have always kind of taken heart to that, you know, where I, I understand I'm dual hatted, you know, since I've been saved in the uniform, it's kind of like, Hey, do you really want Jeff's opinion or do you want Sergeant Wright's opinion of what I can, can say, you know, so I, I usually use those lines. Um, this is really important stuff, so I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Jeff. Thanks, guys. Yeah, just you know, to think about <clears throat> the fact that we, you know, we need to live in a, live in a way that that doesn't allow for compromise in the principles. Daniel and then pursued a compromise in the way we're going to carry this out, but they wouldn't they wouldn't compromise the principles, and I think that's an important distinction. The I and nicer. And I don't think we'll get to all of them tonight, but that's okay. The I in nicer is integrity. Integrity, of course, is one of the Air Force core values. It's a word that we talk about a lot. Let me throw it out there. Define integrity. How would you define that word? Yes, I have always kind of just... My simple version is uh, what you do and no one's watching is, should be the same as what you do and someone is watching. Okay, what you do when no one's watching. Okay, that's a good definition. What are some others? I, you know, <laughs> it's uh, implicit in the definition of the word. Uh, even in his definition, you do what's right when nobody's watching, but you've kind of got to know what is right um, first off. So there's kind of like an objective moral ought. You know, there, there, it's an onus of one to find out what those owing and oughts are and then to live by them regardless of who's watching. You know, it's kind of a, a responsibility type thing as well. Yeah, and that's a great point, Jeff. Certainly if we're, if we're going to talk about doing what is right uh, when nobody's watching, um, yeah, then I kind of have a, a task there, right, to figure out what is right, what does that look like, and, and one of the definitions that I picked up somewhere along the way, doing right simply because it is right, um, and, and again, that, that would drive you to say, even if nobody's watching me, even if nobody's going to pat me on the back for this, um, I'm doing it simply for the reason it's right, and that's really what we see in Daniel and his friends. Look down there at the end of verse 8. Um, it, it defines a little bit of why they did what they did. They weren't looking to get promoted. 
they weren't looking to make themselves out to, to look like they were better than anyone else. What was their motive? And down in the end of verse eight, he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. That was all it was about for Daniel and his friends. We're seeking right simply because it's the right thing to do. And they, and they were gonna let the consequences, let the chips fall where they fell, but we're going to do right because it is the right thing to do. And God blessed that. We, we know through this story and through what we know about Daniel, how God continued to bless him, how he blessed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, because they had this attitude of integrity, no compromises and integrity. And we learn later, we learn later on over in chapter six, this wasn't a one-off thing for Daniel. It wasn't just integrity in this moment because, well, it seems expedient right now. It seems to be a good thing to do to advance my career at this point. You know, the boss is watching and I'm interacting with him, so I better look like a man of integrity. It wasn't a one-off thing for Daniel. Flip over to chapter 6, Daniel chapter 6. Here in Daniel chapter 6, there's a new king in town now. And you remember this story. Um, this, of course, is the, the lead-in to Daniel and the lion's den. That the, the officials have convinced the king to pass a decree that no one can pray to anyone except the king. Because they, they recognize something in Daniel. Um, I'm, I'm reading the, the definition of integrity. No empty words, no white lies, no token prayers, no, no compromise. That's awesome. Um, but but the, the officials around Daniel realized something, and that was they, they, they saw this integrity, and they said, listen, if we're going to trip this guy up in any way, it's going to have to be something that has to do with his God, because there's no fault. We can't find any fault with him in the, in the workplace. And so then down in verse number 10, though, we get an idea that this living integrity, this living a life of no compromise was not a one-off thing for Daniel. Look down at verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house. Now, in his roof chamber, he had windows toward Jerusalem. And he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God. And what's that last phrase? as he had been doing previously. This wasn't something that Daniel just started in this moment. It wasn't something he introduced simply because it was the best course of action for this particular situation. It was a habit of his, something that was a, a regular part of his life. Who's got Galatians chapter 6, verse 9? I can get it. Okay. Galatians 6, verse 9 is... I feel like I know that by heart, but I don't want to say it. <laughs> you probably do. Um, and let us not grow weary while doing good. Or in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Yeah, that's uh, one I tell my kids. <laughs> yeah, let let us not become weary in doing good, right? And that's that's the instruction there. That was you know this was a part of Daniel's life, living a life of integrity. It was a regular thing, and you know I mentioned this on Sunday, different context. But if we if we don't do this in a non-crisis time, then it's not going to happen in a crisis time. In other words, if we're not pursuing integrity, say, Lord, what is right? And, and I'm going to pursue that for the sake of right, just because it's right. I may not get anything out of it. I, maybe nobody will even notice. But I'm going to pursue right strictly for the sake of right. And, and if, we, if we make that a habit, then in a time of crisis, it will also be our habit. But if we don't make it a habit, in non-crisis times, it will not it will not come out in the time of crisis. We will our integrity will slip then as well. I think about it this way. You know, we're all affiliated with the military somehow, so I think of it this way. 
you don't train for war when you're in the foxhole. You know, when the bullets start to fly, that's not the time to think, man, you know what? I guess it's time to figure out how, how I'm supposed to shoot this gun. And that's not the time to train for warfare, not when you're in the foxhole, in the mix of the battle. You train beforehand so that when you get in the crisis and when you get in battle, when you're faced with a situation, your reaction's automatic. Daniel practiced integrity. It was a part of his life, a part of who he was on a regular basis. So when this situation came up, I think the fact that Daniel settled this in his mind, that he wasn't going to defile himself, I think that was, in his mind, was the obvious choice. Of course, that's what I'm going to do. Of course, I'm not going to compromise. Of course, I'm going to live in, in integrity because that's what I do. It's my habit all the time. And integrity really is, from a biblical perspective, just allowing, Jeff, as you pointed out, what is right, allowing biblical principles to guide our actions and guide our decisions. And when we're at work, do you cut corners just because it's easier that way? And Ruben, you mentioned this in the area of compromise. Do you go along to get along? Well, that's, that seems to be what everybody else is doing. That's what makes everybody happy. I'll just go along to get along. Do you view things and say the end justifies the means? Listen, it doesn't matter how I do it as long as I get it done. It doesn't matter how I treat people as long as I get a result. And those are all things that, that, are, that are running contrary to this idea of integrity, of doing right regardless, just for the sake of the fact that it's right. And we can't be surprised if others don't react well. When you and I take a stand for integrity in society, on social media, in the workplace, when we take a stand for what is right, we can't expect a ticker tape parade. You know, folks aren't going to throw roses at our feet and say, whoa, I, I, you know, I couldn't wait for you to finally stand up for what's right. They're probably not going to do that. They didn't do that for Daniel and his friends. In fact, it pushed them, it rubbed them the wrong way. It pushed them the wrong way. They reacted very poorly. And we can't be surprised. They didn't react well to Daniel when he stood up for right. They didn't react well to the apostles when they stood up for right. They didn't react well to Jesus when he stood up for right. Acts chapter 5, verse 41. Can somebody grab that one for us? Here we go. Then they went out from the presence of the Sanhedrin, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to be treated shamefully on behalf of the name. Hmm. Let me ask you something. <laughs> when is the last time <laughs> when you were criticized or you would consider you would consider the situation suffering? or you would consider the situation to be an extreme trial or a difficulty, particularly because you took a stand for your faith, when is the last time you considered that something to rejoice about? When did you say, that was awesome? Not the suffering, that stunk, but the fact that I had been considered worthy to suffer for the name of Christ that somebody noticed that I was a believer and that's why I'm, I'm the subject of this criticism or the subject of this suffering. Integrity is not always an easy thing to do. I, you know, it's, it is one of the Air Force core values and I think it is because it's an important thing, but it's not an easy thing to do. But it's an important thing. If we're going to live out what it means to be a Christian in the workplace, We've got to resolve in our minds ahead of time that I'm not going to be defiled. I'm going to, as best I can, I'm going to pray for God's strength and pray for his ability. I'm going to stand firm in the workplace. I'm not, I'm not going to be a jerk about it, but I'm not going to be defiled. I'm going to stand firm. I'm going to be a person of integrity. I'm going to know what is right. What does God expect of me as far as my interpersonal relationships? 
and how I react and how I talk to one to other people and how I treat them. What does God expect from me? I'm going to know what is right and I'm going to live what is right. Whether people are around, whether I get pat on the head for it, whether anybody notices or not, I know that the Lord notices. And that for me is enough. Okay, we are running out of time tonight. So we got to two letters of nicer and I was afraid that would happen, that we wouldn't be able to cover everything tonight. Um, but we'll cover the, the rest of it next week. We'll cover C, E, and R next week. Um, and so next week, we'll pick up where we were, continuing there in Daniel chapter 1. Um, let, me spend, let me spend our last couple of minutes in prayer together. And uh, is there anything in particular that we can be praying about, or praying for each other for? I think uh, an important one is to be in prayer about all these restrictions and how how much this has been used to um, facilitate disunity and mm -hmm. you know just lack of connections and personal connections amongst the church. And I, I think we should probably keep in mind that God's in control and can erase these restrictions for us. And uh, so we can get back to normalcy, even though this is maybe a glimpse of what our future looks like. But um, I know that he's able to to bring us all back together. And that's been a really stroke, big struggle. But uh, now that we've figured out comms, we can come back together. Amen. All right, Jeff, we'll continue. We'll, we'll pray for that here in just a minute. Anything else? Okay, well, let's end our time in a word of prayer. Father, you are so good to us. And Lord, every day I'm just absolutely amazed at how good you are, and how faithful you remain, even though I am not always faithful. Yet you're always there, willing to forgive, willing to clean me back up and pick me back up when I do compromise, when I do let my integrity slip. You're always there. And thank you. Thank you for giving us your word. Thank you, Lord, for this story about Daniel. At first seems almost like a, you know, a, a story that we go, how, how in the world can something that happened so far, so lo long ago in such a distant culture and a distant time and a distant place, how can that ever apply to my workplace today? Well, we see it. Your word is always relevant. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It pierces to the, the bone and the marrow, the heart of the matter, the heart of every matter. Thank you for giving us that. And Father, I pray that as we, all of us, as we attempt to live our faith and be examples for you in the workplace father would you help us as we just talked about these two issues tonight no compromise and being men and women of integrity would you help us to do that we desperately need you father we do want to continue to lift up these covid restrictions or as jeff has reminded us you're still on the throne you've not been knocked off by this you've not been caught off guard by covid you're not overwhelmed by it. You are completely in charge, completely in control. And Lord, we trust you. Lord, your word also tells us, bring our requests to you, make our requests be known. Our request is these restrictions would go away. That our ability to connect together as a, as a family of God would be restored. Our ability to be out and about and, and interact in the community, interact around town. Lord, that those, those abilities would be restored. Father, you would put your hand and stay this, this disease. Take it away. Lord, we know that's within your capability tomorrow. You could take it away. Lord, we pray that, that you would do that. And if you choose not to, Father, we pray you would give us wisdom to know how is it that we can interact in the midst of this? How can we still be witnesses for you, even with the limitations the world tries to throw our way? Father, thank you for the time we've had together tonight, for the opportunity to open your word. 
Lord, I pray for your blessing on every family that's that's here in the Zoom call, every family that will join us via YouTube. And Lord, I pray you'd bless them tonight, bless the rest of their week as we come together this weekend to celebrate a time of fellowship on Saturday, sing praises to you and celebrate you on Sunday. Would you just bless all of our time together? Lord, we love you. We praise you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. Well, thank you for joining me tonight. We will finish up this uh, particular question next week. Ruben, you said you've got some more. Um, Jeff, Kate, if you have got some questions you want us to deal with, shoot them my way. Those of you in the YouTube audience, same thing. If you have specific questions that you want us to try to deal with here in these next several weeks, um, shoot them my way, and we'll try to cover as many of them as we can here on our evening Bible study. Let me know what you think about whether you want to continue this into the fall or you want to just let it just be a summertime adult VBS. Um, and then if you have some specific thoughts about concerning us studying First Thessalonians in the fall, if we do consider or if we do continue. All right. Well, I'm glad you joined us tonight. I hope you have a great rest of the week and we will see you on hopefully on Saturday and then hopefully again on Sunday. God bless you. Have a good night. Thank you. See you later. Bye-bye. Night, all. Night, Sirtis. <laughs>